On the surface, it looked like huge success. You know, I was making it big and I was living the dream. But underneath it all, I realized that something was missing. And I was starting at that point to really question, what am I doing here? And right on the back, when he said that, there was a voice inside of me. And it was such a strong voice and a loud voice. And it said, if you wouldn't do it this way next time, why are you doing it now? And it was a voice that just stopped me in its tracks. To this day, I remember the force of that voice. And I tried to ignore it. But a week later, it was clear that it was like, I was done. It was just a really clear moment of like, you're done. I had begun to meditate. I had begun to practice yoga. What was happening was just an awakening to another self. There was the corporate self, very, very mentally driven. And then there was emerging um, a different self. And a week later, it just became really clear. I handed in my notice and I had so much to lose. I had a beautiful apartment in Santa Cruz on the on the Pacific coast, two blocks from the beach. I had a, a dream job. I had a visa that was tied to my work. It's the dance between structured and unstructured. It's the dance between form and formless. It's the dance between the mind and the heart. I knew I had a book in me. It was like something that wanted to come out. It was something that wanted to come through, something that wanted to be born. What I saw through that process of living through the tsunami and being with Amma and in the ashram environment at that time was that everything became about how do we support and help those who have lost their loved ones along the coast. Good leaders who lead from purpose help create meaning for the organization, for the people who work with them. They are able to connect their work to something that's larger than themselves. Hello everybody and welcome back to Eliminating Dialogues number 14, where we sit down with a guest and having a dialogue and hopefully an illumination to journey in a conversation to maybe a place we haven't gone before and to illuminate both the speakers and the listeners. And today I have the very pleasure of talking to Jules Lewis today. How are you, Jules? I'm really well. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming on. And for those who don't know Jules, I can give a short introduction. Jules is bringing 20 plus years of leadership, culture and strategy experience facilitating and delivering global leadership programs with clients ranging from Babcock, Ring Central, National Grid, and of course, Thermo Fisher Scientific, and also trained as a yoga instructor in Hatha Yoga, teaching for about four years, and writing the book Enlightened Business, Leadership for Success, which Joe's kindly sent me here and I've been reading this and it's been a really fantastic book to read so thank you again for coming on and I guess uh, my first question that I like to start this podcast with is what lights you up it's a great question Jyoti and I've watched a couple well a few of your podcasts now and I love the way you start with that question um, because it just brings energy into the conversation, which I think is great. And uh, I think there are two things that light me up. One is connection. I absolutely love uh, connecting with people. But to me, connection is also broader than just a personal connection between people. It's also about connecting to something larger than ourselves. Um, it's about connecting dots. I love seeing how things relate to each other, seeing the bigger picture, seeing um, connecting ideas as well um, really lights me up. And the second thing that lights me up is meaning. Mm. Essentially, it's just about just finding the um, meaning in the everyday. Uh, the Japanese have a word for this called ikigai, which loosely translates to purpose. And I think you know, I, I'm sure we'll come to it, but purpose is one kind of like key section, if you like, of, of, of the book that I wrote. And purpose is important, but I think actually un underlying the core concept of purpose is this concept of meaning. And how do we find meaning in the everyday? How do we find meaning in every interaction, in every piece of work, in every action that we do? Where is the meaning um, behind it? And so that's what lights me up, is finding meaning and connecting, connection. 
And hopefully the viewers as well, as you share this, can hear that light coming from you. Because I really feel, and especially with your book as well, reading through that, there really seems to be a sense of that you've gone uh, to that area to find out what does it mean to me to do things. And your book, every page, it feels like you've gone through the process of understanding what does it mean for me to do business, to facilitate, but also to write this book. And I think in this day and age, and the reason I started this podcast was to find people and interact with people who are doing meaningful work and bringing that to the world as well. And so before we get into um, corporate world and the meaning there and what is it like to lead with purpose, I wonder if you can share to the viewers, because I think your journey has just been so fascinating and inspiring in itself. How did your journey start in the, let's say, in the corporate world and I know that you've done some traveling as well. So if you could unfold that story for the viewers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, yeah, my I would say that my career big break came in my late 20s. I think I was actually I was probably about 27, 28. And I'd been working for a an outsourcing company, a training outsourcing company in Bracknell in Berkshire, but we had global clients. So we were working with Cisco, with Nortel, Lucent at the time. These are these are company names that no longer exist apart from Cisco. Cisco is the big success story. Um, and I was working on a contract that required me to work with Asia Pacific very, very early in the morning and then work US side very, very late at night. And at one point, the U.S. Um, contract with Cisco became so demanding that they were considering hiring somebody on the West Coast, um, at which point I was, I, you know, I, I remember the day that I, I pretty much marched into the MD's office and said, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> uh, hello, I'd love to go. Um, <laughs> and um, so it was. So, you know, that's where the opportunity came from. And so I moved over, I think, in about 97, 98, I can't remember the exact uh, the exact year. Um, and it was a vertical learning curve. You know, I remember um, kind of joining a team, but then having to build a team from scratch. And what we were doing was literally creating the sales certification program um, for their training partners globally. They had, they had a very good technical certification pro program, but not for sales. And uh, that's that's what we were tasked with doing. And it was round the clock. It was, you know, it was intense. And the pace at Cisco at the time was intense. It was literally, you know, Silicon Valley in those days was called uh, Cisco Valley because they were building so many buildings. I think there were 40 buildings going up at one point along one entire stretch of the valley. And the buzz was incredible. The culture was incredible. The sense of excitement was incredible. And, you know, I thought I'd made it. I had the Mustang. I was, you know, I was working in Silicon Valley. I was heading out to the ocean um, for the few hours I would have at the weekends. And we would ski in Lake Tahoe in the winters. And it was, you know, everything was great. And um, that contract, because I was a contractor, so I, I, you know, I wasn't an employee. I was still working for the company, the UK company. And from there, when, once we had launched the sales certification program globally, that all went very well. And I then uh, started work with Compaq in Houston, in Texas. Mm. And that was, again, setting up a team from scratch. So I hired 20 people from scratch at an office. And that was to explore their um, customer relationship management system that they'd invested millions of dollars in, but the salespeople weren't using it. So that became a huge change management program with Compaq, with this team that I hired. And um, at the same time, the UK company had begun a kind of like startup arm uh, with a piece of software that would work with Microsoft Dynamics that would help change um, change the way salespeople used CRM at a very high level. Mm. So once again, I was working around the clock um, and I was, you know, for... Uh, for Monday to Friday, I would fly from San Jose to Houston, and then I would land back in San Jose on Friday evenings. And eventually I realized this was unsustainable. And I was starting at that point to really question, what am I doing here? Um, my relationship was falling apart. I'd moved over with my partner from the UK. 
um, I was deeply, deeply unhappy on one level. Um, so on the surface, it looked like huge success. Mm -hmm. You know, I was making it big and I was living the dream, um, the corporate dream and the American corporate dream. Um, but underneath it all, I realized that something was missing. And there was um, one one week in particular that was really tough. It was a software release that was scheduled that we didn't make. I had to tell the client, you know, basically, we're not going to make the software release schedule. And I remember getting on that plane at Houston and just thinking, I, you know, th this is not going well. And my my um, colleague at the time said in his big Texan drawl, drawls, you know, next time round, this we're not going to do it this way. Mm. And right on the back, when he said that, there was a voice inside of me, and and it was such a strong voice and a loud voice, and it said, if you wouldn't do it next time, if you wouldn't do it this way next time, why are you doing it now? And it and it was a voice that just stopped me in its tracks, uh, in my tracks. And to this day, I remember the force of that voice, and it wouldn't leave me. Like that, the, this stayed with me for the weekend. And I tried to ignore it because I was like, okay, well, if I don't do this, then what do I do? But a week later, it was clear that it was like I was done. It it was just a really clear moment of like you're done. And I'd been living this life for five years by this point, and in this time, I'd been kind of landing back on Friday evenings and driving up to um, a yoga retreat place in Napa Valley. Mm. And so I had begun to meditate. I had begun to practice yoga. This had been for about six months now. And I think what was happening was just kind of like an awakening to another self, if you like. So there was the corporate self, very, very mentally driven, very action driven. And then there was emerging um, a different self that was much more geared towards being in nature, being still, um, inquiring into the nature of self, hence meaning, I suppose, looping back to what lights me up. I think that's where that was ignited. And a week later, it just became really clear. I handed in my notice and I had so much to lose. I had a beautiful apartment in Santa Cruz on the on the Pacific coast, two blocks from the beach. I had a, a dream job. I had a visa that was tied to my work. And that was that that was the really hard thing for me was like, my goodness, I'm basically saying that in nine months time, I may not still be able to be in the US. Mm. But it was such a strong calling if you like it was such a strong voice that I, I I just had to give it up um and from there I did take those nine months and I um I trained as a yoga teacher I I visited Peru I went down I, I didn't climb Machu Picchu I wanted to find my own way and I just kind of like explored the Andes um a little I went to Burning Man which is just an awesome festival in the Nevada desert and um that kind of like blew my mind um literally so we have an expression called you know blowing our mind mm. but then i realized that actually it is possible to have your mind blown because you're in an environment where there is creativity on such a scale beyond what your imagination thought was possible and in that moment it's mind blowing literally because it 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 reveals the hitherto impossible I, I would say that was that was incredible. Anyway, nine months later, the visa expired. It's like, what do I do? Do I get married in order to stay in the States? Do I stay in the States illegally or do I come home to the UK? Which for me was the worst possible option. Um, and that's what I did because I realized actually that coming back to the UK meant um, overcoming my resistance to, to being back here for various reasons. And I just had to move back and... Um, taught yoga in London for a number of months, having taught it in, in the US as well. And um, I actually missed, I missed the intellectual aspect of working in business. I worked, missed, I, I missed working with change management. I missed corporate. I didn't miss the lifestyle. I missed the work. Mm. And so what I did was um, it word got back that I was back and um, my old employers reached out to me and said, hey, can you come back and, and work with us? And I said, yes, I will, as long as I'm self-employed, as long as it's on a contract basis. Mm -hmm. And that then enabled me to um, travel to India and um, balance this corporate work with um, the yoga and 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 the meditation and um 
yes eventually I went full-time self-employed and contract but that was kind of like the later stage but that's how my journey started I feel like I've been talking for a long time but it was quite a long story so incredible thank you so much for sharing all that and I think the authenticity and the vulnerability that comes across is so powerful because often when we give permission to ourselves and like your book we start to give permission to others as well and I think there's so many strands I could pull across there. But I think one that jumps out to me is that when we're in this uh, cycle of success, let's say, uh, in this cycle, it can be so easy to be caught up in the success and how good it looks or how good it feels. But this inner voice is not something you can see. It is not something, um, yeah, it's there in the physical world. but it's something very real and it's something that will bring not just fulfillment to ourselves but also to other people in a certain way and what you were saying there about and I know you've used uh, different terms in the book about balancing the the inner voice and our inner gifts or intuition let's say and also uh, working in some sort of corporate structures or working uh, with the structures already existing and how to balance the, uh, the two. And I think it's a very interesting that you use the word sustainable as well. So before we go into maybe balancing these two and, and how you manage to go into this journey, because uh, I know a lot of people sometimes are on, on one side of the path or another side of the path. But what really jumps out to me and what lights me up is that you were able to take this middle way uh, sort of approach. So before we kind of delve into that, um, you mentioned traveling to India and um, learning some meditations, learning some yoga. I'm, I'm wondering, going from California in the Silicon Valley to India, what was it that you learned in, in India that started to open your eyes uh, to a different way of being in touch with yourself? It's a, yeah, it's a great question because there's, it, it taught me so much, Jyoti. Um, it was truly a transformational time. Mm. I went for two months and I actually did a two month Ayurveda program. And I know you've, you've had a couple of podcasts um, on with, with, with a doctor, with an Ayurvedic doctor. Um, it's called Panchakarma and it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a deep, deep Ayurveda program. Um, process I would say it's not even just a program it's a process during that time I was not allowed I say not allowed um not from a control perspective but just because of the depth of the process um no reading no internet no wind um you have to have your head covered so there was no walking on the beach because the ashram is literally on the beach in Kerala um no walking on the beach I mean effectively it was just be still, you know, if I, if I, if I shortcut and bypass all the do nots, the one thing, you know, it meant was that I just had to be still. Mm. And that was the first time in my life that I think I had, had permission to just be still. Um, so the first thing was about um, dropping the identification with action with activity as being a core part of who I am, you know, and, and, I, and I don't think that's unusual. I think in the West, we are hugely identified with what we do and the outcome of what we do, the results that come as a result of what we do. And in the vacuum, if you like, that was created by this dropping of activity came a huge realization of actually how much control there is in the way that we live our lives when we are identified with what we do and the and our activity, as opposed to actually allowing whatever wants to emerge to emerge. And many people who have traveled in India say that actually, if you go to India and you're used to having to be to, to live in quite a controlled or controlling life, nothing is better for you <laughs> than being in India because it's almost like you just can't. That it, it, Being in India, 
it forces you to be in flow. Mm. And so that can feel really uncomfortable at first. But when you do get, when you do learn to be in this flow of life, that it, it, it just becomes a lot easier. Mm. It just becomes a lot easier. And, um, you know, yeah, you have to get through past your resistance and the mind that wants to control definitely struggles, but actually on a certain level, um, it teaches you that actually we're not in control and that then you learn to act from a different place. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, of course, we are beings of action, right? So we have to take action. The question is, are we identified with that action? Are we, are we identified with the results of our actions? And that's what creates suffering. So actually, when we drop our identification with action and the results of our action, then there's more peace and there's more flow. And then we can act from a place, um, from a deeper place. And believe me, I got, I got glimpses of this in the two months. I would say that it's still a journey of learning and it's still a process. Um, but that was definitely one core. I would say that was the core transformational realization that I had was who's the doer. And what happens when we drop that sense of doership? Um, so that was one. I would say the second core realization, because while I was there in the middle of this Panchakarma Ayurveda program, um, the tsunami struck, mm -hmm. and um, I, I happened to literally be in the in the middle of a treatment when the tsunami struck. Um, and the whole story could take a lot longer. I'll, I'll just say that um, we were evacuated from the ashram because the ashram was flooded. We went over to the other side of the backwaters. And um, my 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 teacher, a, a sadguru, a master, if you like, Amma, um, what I was able to see was actually what happens when uh, grace kicks in. And actually it became all about service. So whereas I went to India very much focused on me, my spiritual path, my evolution, what is my purpose in this life. What I saw through that process of living through the tsunami and being with Amma and in the ashram environment at that time was that everything became about how do we support and help those who have lost their loved ones along the coast, al al along the Andaman coast. Um, how does how does the ashram support the government in being at the local government and being able to create and uh, and and provide housing immediately for those who had lost their homes? Um, I was put to work, even though service, if you like, and work and activity was kind of like prohibited during this Panchakarma time. The need was so great that actually people from all over India were sen sending their clothes, their used clothing and garments, um, to 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 distribute to the local communities and so i was sorting through mountains of old garments saris shawls um, that people had donated and for me it was a real realization because frankly these were these were items of clothing that in the west and in the uk um wouldn't really even make it to charity shops and yet the generosity and the giving and the compassion the 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 overflowing of compassion and love that had come from all over India to support these, you know, to support us and the local community touched me deeply. And I think I, that again, that was the spark. That was the start of the spark of realizing that actually we are here in service. We are here to give. And so I came to India very much focused on me, 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 my spiritual path, my cleansing, my Ayurvedic, you know, process to, wow, like actually it's just all about others and it's about giving and it's about compassion. And just so as you, deep. yeah, and just as you say that, say that I've, I'm touched deeply with this story as well. So thank you for sharing this because I also went to India last year and uh, for the first time in my adult life, and uh, also I was finding it hard the first few days in Delhi, you know, letting go of everything. And what you say about control is so true. And uh, of course, being in the corporate or 
just being in, in the Western lifestyle, sometimes we don't realize we have the control or we are living by control until we're in that environment. And like what you were speaking to, shifting from that me to we, you know, turning that M upside down to a W. Um, and that in itself, that small shift, that we can even be caught in this cleansing journey. And even if it seems spiritual, it's still from a me standpoint. Mm. So I think it was just so many beautiful lessons that I came across. And um, I think as you share, shared that, um, people can often be uh, swayed into this meditation aspect of maybe not wanting to achieve anything or just wanting to be, um, you know, in this being aspect. But I think you mentioned a really interesting point. Who is the doer and where am I doing things from? And I think that leads us nicely into um, what did you realize then coming back into the West? What what did you f feel that shift in doing was for you? And what did you feel then called to do as you then came back uh, in, into the West mm -hmm. and into the corporate setting? When I went to India, the work I'd been doing was project management and change management for customer relationship management implementations. And when I came back, that work did continue. I became, I think that's when my um, interest, I think it was a latent passion, to be honest. It's something I've always been fascinated in, but organizational culture. Mm. Because it became less about the project plan and less about the system implementation and the processes that would need to change around the new system and much more around how do organizations work in a way that they can generate energy around something, around a project or an idea? How can they inspire people to want to change mm. as opposed to imposing change on them? And so from a from a control to flow evolution, that's what I came back with. And I think that absolutely shaped and informed my work later in terms of, okay, how do we create cultures where people want to bring their best selves to work? How do we create a culture where people are inspired to bring their best selves to work and be their best, not just for themselves, but for others as well. Mm. Um, so I think that was the shift. It became a shift from change management around software to culture and people. And that's absolutely what started me on the path then towards culture and leadership, because ultimately leaders shape culture. Um, and uh, that that that's how that whole branch, I, I branched out. It wasn't a complete change. It was just a branching out. And as a coach, that's super interesting because um, people often feel that, uh, what do you mean I should bring my full self to work? You know, work is just work. And it's a whole uh, almost mindset shift. And it's, it's an empowering really of saying, hey, you can actually give your full self permission. And again, it comes back to that voice inside. You can give that uh, permission to use your gift set, to use your skills, um, and how do we actually integrate that? Like as opposed to, like you said, uh, imposing a change, but actually having more of a natural uh, approach to that. Mm. So I'm just wondering, um, this logical or linear way of operating, I think you mentioned uh, in the book, what were some of the resistances that you noticed that were coming up and how did you how did you facilitate this change to come to a less linear way of operating into a more flow way of operating it's interesting jyoti because 
I didn't like set out with a plan. Mm. So looking back, it's not like I can say, well, this is the three step process I followed, for example, you know. So um, I genuinely believe that it's been an evolution of going deeper and deeper into the yoga practice, the meditation practice, and I see it as a dance. Mm. I see it as a dance between needing form and structure. So, I mean, you would laugh, right? I, I have a bullet journal and, and I spent time yesterday, you know, yesterday was the 1st of April and, and at the beginning of every month, the end of every month or the beginning of every month, it's like, right, okay, let's go back. What am I, I, I don't have... I don't have goals, but I do have intentions. And I look at the key areas of my life and I look at how those are evolving and not necessarily what I want to. Yeah, I guess in some, some people would look at them and go, yeah, well, that is what you want to achieve, Jules. I just don't relate to it that way. I just say, okay, what would a great month look like, for example? And then, okay, what is it that I need to do to move towards that outcome or move towards what great would look like for this month. And then I break it down into the week and then obviously every day. So I'm very structured when it comes to having focus. I'm not structured. Like I never put anything in my diary that's not structured. So what I won't then do is go, right, okay, so from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, what am I doing? You know, I don't have to have all the space in my in in my diary filled at all. In fact, that would fill me with horror. I'd probably just freeze. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, I can't work like that. You know, if you looked at my diary or at my calendar, the only thing in the calendar is what's actually booked in. So this session, for example. Um, and that means that there is freedom to be able to sense into where my energy is going in that free time. Mm. So I've got a list, but it's like I will I, I'll, I'll look down at it and go, OK, what am I what am I feeling to do right now? Um, and I think that needs to be balanced with time outside um that's why winter can be particularly difficult because obviously you know it's it it is harder to head out if you like um into nature but when i do it is incredibly rewarding so i got up super early on sunday morning to go up we have a nature reserve up the road i live in somerset um at the moment and you know, it was super early with the clock changes as well. Um, it was even earlier. Um, and, and I saw two water voles, which are incredibly, which are actually, I hear, incredibly rare to see. They're called bank voles. And they were just running along and they jumped into the water um, on the levels. And I just wouldn't have seen those if I'd not been, you know, if I'd not been out in nature very, very early in the morning. So I think it's a combination between having focus and having some structure, but enough flexibility and enough freedom to be able to allow it for inspiration, to be able to allow for what gives you meaning and what helps connect you. However, whatever that looks like. For me, it's about connecting to the natural world. Um, for other people, it could be you know learning something completely different tuning into your podcast, for example, creating time for something that's outside of the ordinary day-to-day -day doing this. Mm. And I would say it's about just creating a rhythm that allows for both to have space, mm. um, to work alongside each other and to feed each other. And that's what I mean by the dance. It's the dance between structured and unstructured. Mm. It's the dance between form and formless. And it's the dance between the mind and the heart in terms of what brings us joy and what we enjoy doing. Amazing. And to the people watching, I'm sure that's very inspiring, no matter whether they're working in corporate or, you know, whether they're, you know, uh, working in any other place in life. It's all a dance. And that is life. Mm. Like you said, having that space, having that freedom, and it comes back to the meaning and why we're doing this because often people will say well how would that drive success or uh, but I think underneath that like you were saying it's well why are we wanting success in the first place 
Mm-hmm. Um, what are we needing the success for? And then that way we can actually be more successful because then the success is towards a we, a greater purpose, rather than success being on a very individualistic standpoint. So having that space, having that freedom and being able to tap into our intuition. I know that I go on walks during my working breaks and actually it can help because when I come back, I can often tap into some idea that can help a customer or a problem can get solved in a certain way. Yeah. Um, so on the business standpoint, that's great. But at the same time, I'm also tapping into uh, my own life or my own being. And so I'm not lost that the success is not almost taking over me, but I'm more in control of you know, the success or what I want success to be. So, yeah. So thank you for, for sharing that. And, and if we could talk about how you started to write Enlightened Business and the Sustainable Success Approach. I'm just wondering that coming through all of these experience, what was it that got you to got you to the point that you were thinking to yourself, okay, now's the time for me to write a book. So what inspired you to write Enlightened Business? Uh, you know, leadership for sustainable success. I had for years loved writing. Mm. I, when I say for years, I I have always loved writing, right? That has always been um, a a joy for me. And I think I, I knew I had a book in me. It was like something that wanted to come out. It was something that wanted to come through, something that wanted to be born. And at the time, I was absolutely passionate because I think because embarking on this you know, spiritual path, this spiritual journey of of yoga and meditation and meeting Amma and being in, in, in India, I was passionate about bringing these spiritual principles into business and helping business leaders and not just leaders, helping anybody in business to be able to integrate um, spiritual principles with their day-to-day work and life. And I think probably it was because I had struggled so much with it. And so I felt actually I've I've kind of like lived this path. It was actually really hard, but I kind of felt like I had I had insights, you know, I had gifts to share as a result of 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 living that journey and and going through that experience. And it's quite hard for me now to look back and actually say that because I'm in a different place now, which is that and having kind of like written the book, it was just really interesting that through writing the book, I realized that actually these so-called spiritual principles or qualities, if you like, or characteristics. And so, for example, some, you know, truth, surrender, for example, creativity, trust, they're not necessarily spiritual characteristics or qualities at all. They are actually human qualities and characteristics it's just what they look like when we're at our best, mm. right? When we're able to live them fully. Um, but at the time, I was so identified with being this kind of like spiritual being on a spiritual path and taking it quite honestly, quite seriously, too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, this is something I want to share. It actually took me a really long time. Like I hear some people write books in, you know, like maybe a year, eight months to a year. I think it took me two and a half years to write and um, and I didn't hurry it. And that's because I wanted it to, I, you know, to reflect what we've been talking about really was I wanted it to emerge. And interestingly, after writing the book and after it was published, um, it was quite a process for me because I actually had quite a strong physiological response or my, my body had a physiological response to it being published, which was that I then had, I mean, literally almost immediately had frozen shoulder. I went into frozen shoulder on one side of my body and anybody who's been through frozen shoulder knows how painful it it is. Um, And it also lasts a long time if you don't catch it super early. It lasted about 18 months to two years on one side. It released from one side. I then had three months free of pain And um, it started on the other side. So I actually had to go through bilateral 
uh, frozen shoulder. And I think that was the final process for me to realize that although I had wanted it to emerge, although I had wanted it to be um, an inside out process, I clearly had been pushing on some level. And I clearly was identified with being the author of this book um, because it, this this frozen shoulder process forced me into a phase of really having to acknowledge limitations, mm. physical limitations that then had other impacts on my work because for, um, for, for a long time, I couldn't type. I had to use Dragon Dictate as a piece of software to, 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 to do anything emails dictation of emails work anything um so it was quite a process the starting point was just wanting to share my journey and share all this incredible wisdom that i had gained through living this path um the end point of it honestly hand in heart hand hand on heart was to almost just set it down and forget it it, it was almost like right it's done it's out there move on and it's just really interesting to me that 10 years, almost to the month. So I think 10 years to the month was when it was sent for, for printing. And, um, and, and here we are in 2024, 10 years later. And it feels like it's resurrecting somehow. It's like coming back into my awareness through through people thank you for your interest i was on on another podcast a couple of weeks ago with somebody who said that she remembered a talk i gave round about the time of the of the launch and it's forced me to pick it back up again and look at it again through the lens and through the eyes of kind of like 10 years down the line and i'm enjoying it this is amazing because uh, it's like you said 10 years but i think the way that you wrote it and the with the spirit that you wrote it in, it's really a timeless piece because 10 years ago, you know, I wasn't in the working world, but coming into the working world, um, I've reading this book and I'm like, wow, this resonates. So the, the amount of um, authenticity you wrote it with, and I think mm -hmm. you were saying about the book creation process, and it's the same when I make videos on YouTube. I'm not necessarily trying to get get a video out or rush it for success, but it's again, what does the success mean? Mm. Why are we trying to do this? And uh, it's just super inspiring, I think, not just for people, again, working in corporate, but even people who are wanting to write a book and that whole process of surrendering and the authenticity you speak to. It's it's true. If I could just say one final point on it, because I think this this is also quite important. I I was super upset that there was one mistake in it. So mm. far, I've only been able to find one mistake. And at the end of every chapter, there are kind of like three or four bullet points, key takeaways from the chapter. Mm. And they're super short chapters anyway, as you know, Jyoti. But that you know, it's like okay, these are the key points. And on one of the chapters. I think the bulleting is wrong. It's numbered, and it and it and it. I think it mentions two numbers twice. And I'm so, I was such a perfectionist, and and it and it was so painful for me. And I think what it allowed me to do is just really see up front the pain of perfectionism, mm. um, and uh, that that was a huge process for me as well was actually just letting go of perfectionism. And I truly believe that perfectionism is the ego wanting to be right, the ego wanting to be in control. And uh, it was it was truly a, a process and a gift and a gift. Because of course now I'm reading it and going, really? Like you got, <laughs> I got so hung up over this one error. <laughs> it's just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, so nice. yes, it's, um, it is, the cre I think the creative process itself can be a wonderful way of releasing perfectionism, mm. actually, and just allowing ourselves to be in acceptance of what is, what do we have to give in the here and now, and can that be enough? Can that can that be all that's needed mm. right here, right now? And there's so many topics. As a coach, that gets me so excited, right? It's like uh, letting go, being enough, um, you know, acceptance, and yeah. all of these come through. And like you said, spiritual can become very a uh, heady word, but it's mm. really just our spirit as a human 
when we stop thinking, we tap into the universal principles um, of of who we are ultimately. Um, and I think it just speaks to the soul. And yeah. you mentioned three three things that were really nice how you laid out the book. And um, they spoke to really core values, but the way you laid out the book was very practical as well, which um, is amazing because <laughs> it's quite hard to condense things down into a concise way. So you mentioned purpose, presence, and potential. And if you could speak into what does that really mean as a leader to live those? And what does it give to the organization when you're really practicing purpose, presence, and potential? So starting with purpose, it's about <laughs> meaning. <laughs> it's about our why. And, you know, again, I used to think that purpose was about having a big purpose mission, a life mission, if you like. And I think it it doesn't have to be that grand. It just means that actually as a leader, you have to know why you are leading. And, you know, lead. it's super interesting to me, Jyoti, that the only leadership position usually in an organization that has the word lead or leader in it, in the title, is team, team leader. Mm. Other than that, all leadership roles will be, you know, so you'll have chief something something officer at the, at the most senior exec level. Um, you can have leaders at all sorts of levels in the organizations, but they won't necessarily have leader in their title. And ultimately, the purpose um, when it comes to leadership is, are you here um, why are you here? Why are you leading people? And if it's just because your title, you know, not your title, but your job role says that you need to lead people and it's to get results out of people, then that's only going to take you so far. And actually that's just management. Whereas leading really means that you are carving a clear path of like, why are we here? Mm. So in the same way that an individual purpose is why am I here? What's my sense of meaning in life? What's my, you know, what am I here to do? In an organizational setting, it's about creating that line of sight for people in in terms of, well, okay, what's what's possible here? What's our vision? What's our mission? Why are we here? What do we believe in? What are our values? Um, and, and then connect, helping people to connect that organizational purpose to their individual purpose you know great leaders will sit down with their people and say okay so you know you might not have a life plan you might not have you know a, a clear sense of where you want to be in five years or ten years time however right here right now what is it that lights you up what is it that lights you up in what you're doing and how can we connect that to you know what the organization is 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 here to do mm. um and that's that's what purpose is about really it's about creating meaning you know in a nutshell purpose lead, good leaders who lead from purpose help create meaning for the organization for the people who work with them and that they are able to connect their work to something that's larger than themselves and increasingly we will you know you'll see in surveys in engagement surveys deloitte um, do an, an annual survey around this and meaning and purpose is increasingly important. People want to feel like the work that they're doing is making a difference on some level. Um, I actually always loved Thermo's mission statement um, because I just thought it it was so easy for leaders to be able to help their people understand how they were contributing to making um, the world a cleaner, safer, et cetera, um, place to work, you know? And so, um, so I, you know, it, it, it's just about bridging the two, bridging the organizational purpose with people's individual sense of meaning. Um, so that's purpose. When we come to presence, I genuinely actually believe that presence is a gift. Um, it's, I think that there's no greater gift that you can give somebody than your presence. And what we mean by that is your full awareness in any moment. So you are here, you are putting um, distractions to one side. And, you know, these things are 
<laughs> horrible when it comes to, you know, like interrupting and getting in the way of us being fully present. And so we're not saying that these don't matter. Of course they matter. But when you've got messages coming in, then be fully present and aware when you are responding to your messages. When you're with somebody, give them your full presence, give them your full awareness. Um, and obviously that's where mindfulness practices come in. They can be incredibly helpful to develop presence. Um, presence is always is also, I believe, um, an embodied presence. So it's how how are you demonstrating to somebody physically that you are truly there with them, you know? Um, and that 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 takes practice. Um, and but it can be learnt. It absolutely can be learnt. And it's about being aware. I think that's just how I would translate that. It's just it's about awareness in action. Mm. So actually, that's how Amma translates yoga. Yoga is about bringing awareness into every action. It's not just about the postures on the mat. It's about actually how do we take that into our day to day life and bring it into every action. Um, and, you know, you might also call it the power of focus if you take it out of the yoga, you know, um, field the field of yoga it's just about actually let's let, let let's have focus but focus mentally and physically and emotionally as well because ultimately when we have presence only then are we able to actually have empathy for people and truly relate to them as um more than just producers of work outcomes mm. you know well, it's so like we, we were human beings before we were human resources so the best leaders have the presence to be with their people as people, as human beings, not just as numbers on a spreadsheet. Exactly. And what you were saying about yoga, it's like yoga is union. So yeah. we're really trying to practice these in the real life. And I come from a, a Sikh tradition and we talk about terms like Raj Yoga, which yeah. is like having that union, but also being able to implement that in a setting, we also have this philosophy of midi piri, of um, having this obviously worldly or material values, but also again the spiritual values. And I know Tao and the different traditions all have this um, beautifully as well. And uh, in in the corporate space, like you were talking about, resources. So viewing humans as as um, humans empathy first and obviously when we're sitting down or using our phones our minds can often be you know caught up but then when we're actually sitting down with people um obviously we're doing zoom nowadays since covid a lot and it's harder to connect with human beings but sometimes yeah. just having that conversation having that heart to heart it feels like we're not human resources anymore but we're just humans and I think there's that disconnect in the in the corporate space um, of how we're relating to humans. And I've heard uh, human resources now being rebranded to human capital because you're realizing that <laughs> that okay, humans actually have this cap. It's not it's it's one more step, you know, towards the the ideal. But it's having that um, focus of you know why are we here? Um, what yeah. are we bringing? And to ourself, a sense of empowerment. What do we want to bring? Mm. And I really think it starts from from us as well. Mm. So thank you for sharing Beautiful. that. Presence, no, thank you, Jyoti. Um, and actually, what you you've just bridged into the potential piece, mm. um, and that's the you know that's the the, the field of possibility. Mm. Um, and I believe that truly every every one of us are unlimited beings in our in our potential and good leaders will recognize see potential and then help develop it coach coach for potential um, and provide opportunities for people to grow and demonstrate what they're what they're capable of and, and allow them to follow what where their inspiration takes them 100 percent and um, just as we slowly begin to wrap up, I'm also wondering, uh, you mentioned Bernie Brown in the book, and she's an amazing yeah. um, speaker. And I'm just wondering, what does vulnerability look like in the business? And what does it bring? Because often in business, um, people are af a bit afraid to be vulnerable. Maybe it's a sense of control. But I would argue it's a sense of empowerment as well. 
So what does vulnerability really look like that you've seen? And what does it bring people? It's an interesting one because I'm often challenged by leaders mm. when I say, I mean, we're in a fundamentally different world to the one we were. I mean, I was actually saying this before COVID. So now since COVID, it's even even more so, you know, the case. Um, you know, I'll say, actually, you know, leaders can't have all the answers because nobody has the has all the answers in today's world. You know, I've, I've, I read in a um, Henley Business School report a few years ago that leading today is like being the pilot of a plane, flying the plane while the plane is being built midair, keeping its passengers safe while liaising with air traffic control, while air traffic control is changing the destination of the plane and liaising with all of the aircraft all around it, you know, in the sky at the same time. And, and I thought that was a really powerful metaphor. Like, how can any leader possibly have all the answers or get it right all the time in leading in an environment that is comparable to that in business terms, in organizational terms? And so, you know, it's about learning to say, actually, um, I don't have all the answers. Together, we can figure this out. And being able to navigate through ambiguity, create the conditions where there can be the known knowns and the known unknowns, but also allow space for the unknown unknowns to emerge. Yeah. And that means that you need to create a rhythm, if you like, for each one of those to be played at at any one time. And you know, in 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 some groups, you know, I'll get people turn around and go, but don't you know, don't you lose credibility? I get that a lot, particularly in technical, in in um, software, in in more technical areas of expertise. Um, then you know, leaders are, are worried that their people won't respect them, or that they'll lose credibility if 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 they turn around and basically just say, I don't have the answers, but together we can figure this out. And I'm like, but credibility now comes from different place. Mm. Credibility now comes from how are you able to build trust with your people? Actually, how and when and how often do you communicate what you do know so that actually when you don't have the answers, they at least, they, they believe you, they trust you. So it's about um, where are you putting your attention, basically, as a leader and it's not, you know, the the old paradigm of leadership is basically this is where we're going. Follow me. Um, it's not about leadership as followership now. It's about leadership as um, collaboration, influence, soft skills, soft power, to be able to take people with you on a journey, um, but together. And understanding what is clear, what is unclear, but then creating the capacity, not it used to be there, there used to be a lot of focus on capability. Of course, we still need capability, but what's needed in addition to capability is the capacity mm. to be able to respond to what comes at us from the external environment um, in a much, much quicker way. You know, typically that's called agility. Um, and that's where leaders now need to operate. Um, and that's where they need to be vulnerable. And, if, you know, one, one, just to finish off, I understand, I have empathy for where this comes from. You know, it really struck me that for most people as children, we were rewarded by getting good grades at school, by getting it right. Okay. So we were brought up to believe that when you study hard, i.e. work hard, and you work towards an exam and you're looking to get certain grades because that's what's going to enable you and allow you to progress in life. That's how we're schooled and that's how we're programmed. And then suddenly we now enter the work world where it's like, yeah, you still need to achieve the results, but actually it's not necessarily about working hard, studying hard, having the same. It is about working hard, but not in the same way that we did while we were at school. It's much now, it, now it's much more about relational expertise mm. and you need the technical expertise as well but you have to be able to navigate the 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 unknown and that's not what they teach us at school mm. as far as i know the the international the ib system the international baccalaureate system i think is much better at it than the traditional route um but it's a it's a competency and um it, it needs to be developed
So that's my that's my point. I understand that it's hard to be vulnerable, but it's about learning that actually that's the that's the only way that success will will come in today's environment. So beautiful. And uh, it speaks to the whole point of this whole paradigm shift and your book, I know from reading it, has touched many hearts <laughs> in many places. So thank you just for all of the work that you've done, um, all of the wisdom that you shared today. Um, and, thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. And with that, where can people reach out to you um, if they want to connect? Um, best place is probably LinkedIn. Just connect on LinkedIn. Send me a message. I, you know, I'm more than happy to have a chat and um, yeah, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. And um, if not directly to you, Jyoti, if that's okay, if they can't find me on LinkedIn or you're not on LinkedIn, any <laughs> any listeners, watchers who aren't on LinkedIn, um, you know, my website is there, JulesLewis.co.uk. It's not been updated in quite a long time, but the contact details there are still are, are still are still good. Fantastic, and I'll drop these uh, in the description box below. And of course, uh, if you are interested, you can order this enlightened business book as well, which I'll put in the description below. Thank you so much again, Jules. It was such a pleasure uh, to talk with you. My pleasure too. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank, Thank you. you, Jules. And thanks everyone Thank for you. watching. Bye, Bye everyone.